Most stalking occurs between people who know each other. Less than one third of men and one fourth of women are stalked by strangers. In these circumstances, it can mostly fall into one of three categories. Perhaps the most dangerous of these is the predatory stalker. And in very rare situations, the stalker isn't even human. From a young child being stalked by a crazed man to a group of teenagers who were stalked in the bush by an obsessive cult, this is Stalked in Australia. Welcome back to the final episode of my Halloween series here on Shadow Matter. If you haven't seen the other videos, I've created a playlist that will be linked in the description below and tagged on screen. Today's episode is going to focus on three stories of people being stalked in terrifying circumstances in Australia. One of these stories was actually submitted to me by a subscriber. So if you're watching, thank you PG. So without further delay, put a log on the campfire, pull up a seat, grab some munchies, and enjoy the show. This story was published on Reddit by the author Juggernaut J. Okay, so I'm a guy, and about 11 years ago, when I was 8 years old, me and my family, mum, dad, brother, as well as my brother's girlfriend, who was living with us at the time, went on holiday to Australia to visit some relatives. They lived in rural parts of Victoria, and to give a basic summary of the area, they lived on a farm. The house was surrounded by various fields. When facing the house on the left side, there were two fields, and then at the far end of these fields, there was a highly wooded area with a dirt track running through it. My grandparents, the relatives that lived there, would often go on nature rambles through the forest to spot the wildlife that lived within there. My mother, being a dedicated bird spotter, decides to head off with me and Lisa, my brother's girlfriend, into the forest as we both had a fascination with wildlife. We must have been walking along the dirt track for around 10 minutes, taking pictures of the various animals we'd seen. We passed by a line of motorbikes and around seven bikers having a barbecue. One of the bikers politely smiled at my mother, and she responded with a simple good evening. As we walked past them, one of the bikers approached us and asked us where we were going. We told them, and they informed us that they had been camping in this area for around two nights. They told us to be careful as people had been shooting game in the forest. These people apparently had aggressive dogs, so we were told to be careful. Around 15 minutes later, I spotted an old barn, which I dashed off to explore, being the adventurous child I was. While my mother and Lisa observed a bird of some kind, I didn't tell them where I was going. As I approached the barn, I saw three large dogs tied up outside. They were Rottweilers, and they seemed to be incredibly aggressive. They were on chains and barking and snarling a lot. I didn't think anything of it at the time. I assumed they were for hunting, but looking back, Rottweilers aren't hunting dogs. There was also an old mattress on the floor outside, which appeared to be covered in brown stains and emanated a foul aroma. I was around three feet away from the mattress, but the smell was unbelievably powerful. As I was going to turn around to return to the others, I saw a man emerging from the barn. The image of this man is one of the few things I remember clearly from this day. He was very tall, around six foot four. He was wearing a blue pinstripe shirt. The strangest thing about him was that he was wearing a large top hat. His clothes seemed very worn and his face, the parts of it that weren't covered by a large brown beard, were red as if he had been working out on a hot day. I remember the man smiled and approached me. I asked him if he was a magician, to which he said, No, I look after doggies. Do you like doggies? I told him I did. This is when things started to get weird. He began to approach me and asked if I wanted to come inside and have my picture taken with the dogs. I politely refused and said my mum would be looking for me. He grabbed my hand lightly and said it would only take a second. At that point, I heard my mum shouting to the man, she had come looking for me. The man simply let me go and just stared at her. She asked him again, in which he continued to just blankly stare. He didn't say a word. My mum immediately grabbed my arm, and me, her and Lisa walked as quickly as possible back to the entrance. We got about halfway there when I turned around and told my mother that the magician was following us. She turned around, and sure enough, he was power walking behind us. My mum screamed at him and asked him what he wanted. He didn't reply again simply continued power walking towards us. At that point, my mum began walking even faster to the point that she was dragging me along. The next part of the story is mostly a blur to me. I remember my mum gasping, picking me up and sprinting full pelt with me screaming for help. 
My mum tells me that the man began running towards us and managed to grab my leg. She said that Lisa jumped on the man's back and scratched all across his face before he threw her on the floor. My mum apparently kicked the man in the testicles, grabbed Lisa off the ground and ran with me over her shoulder. I remember we slowed down shortly afterwards and stopped to catch our breath. We continued walking, only for the magician to show up again from the bush area. My mum began to panic and started running with me again. The man was sprinting after us. We were nearing the area where the bikers were camping, and my mum screamed for help. Two bikers emerged from the trees nearby, and my mum screamed, That man tried to kidnap my son. The magician turned around and immediately bolted in the other direction. One of the bikers pursued him, but unfortunately, the magician had a head start. I remember the bikers were incredibly nice, and I soon forgot about the strange man after one of the bikers let me sit up on his motorbike while my mum and Lisa went in the sidecar. The guy took us into the nearest town and dropped us off at the police station, where my mum filed a report. After that, he gave us all a lift back home, which was really nice. I never got to thank him at the time, as I didn't really understand the situation. But on the off chance that you're a reader of Let's Not Meet, I would like to say thanks. As for you, magician, whose intentions for me I'm unsure of, let's not meet ever again. This story was published on Creepypasta by the author Cassandra Wolfe. I've spent a good portion of my life out in the Australian bush, enough time that there is very little left out there that can surprise or scare me. I've tussled with massive scubber bulls and lived to tell the tale, and I've even come across good-sized king brown snakes and funnel-web spiders that would send most city people running with their tail between their legs. I've learned not to be so arrogant about knowing the bush now. The land has proven that it still holds many secrets, many of which aren't meant to be known. It started during 2011, right at the end of the wet season. We had only just started work again, seeing as flooding and dangerous conditions made most work too risky. There was enough grass and water for the cattle, so it wasn't a concern other than to worry about how much stock we'd lost in the flood water. The first thing that indicated that something was wrong was rather innocuous. We started finding dead cattle in the paddocks. We didn't think much of it at the time, merely hauled the carcasses away the minute we could get to them. Young stock die all the time, after all. Whether it was snakes or feral dogs, or even just exposure to the elements, we weren't sure. We just assumed it was nothing, and continued with our jobs. Then a pair of horses died, along with one of the cattle dogs. A snake bite could have explained it. After all, there are multiple poisonous reptiles in the outback, but it was the way we found the carcasses that made us scratch our heads. They'd been torn apart. Feral dogs didn't come near the house, where we kept the dogs and horses. Even those with a lot of dingo blood in their veins were very wary of humans. But what else could it have been? Australia isn't one for large land predators. It soon became nothing but campfire talk. However, as weeks passed without any more signs of the elusive predator, we were starting to get into mustering season, and as such we hired a few farmhands and jackaroos to help with the cattle, and didn't have time for idle conversation. It was on one of these musters that the creature struck again, not a cow or a horse this time, but one of the jackaroos. He went galloping into the scrub to chase after a few stray stairs, and although the cattle came racing out to join the mob that was starting to form, he and his horse didn't. We searched for him, but never found any sign of him, People were starting to grow worried about whatever it was. They'd lurked in the darkness. We were far from civilization, with nothing but our horses and saddlebags on us. We heard the feral dogs howling that night. There were a fair few on the station, most with a strain of dingo in them. Pure dingoes were rare now on the mainland, but all of us slept with a gun in our hands. We doubted it was a dingo that was causing all the trouble, but what else could it have been? One of the men with us seemed extremely anxious. He was Aboriginal in origin and had been raised on the native folklore of bunyips and demon dingoes, which he relayed to us over the fire. We laughed it off, of course. Native stories have always been treated that way, unfortunately. Either way, he wanted us to head straight back to the house, which was still a few days' travel from us. The following day was silent. We remarked on it as we rode, for such silence was unusual in the bush. There were always cockatoos and other birds causing a ruckus, along with a multitude of insects. Lizards would sunbathe on red rocks and skitter away when disturbed. There was nothing at that moment. The land appeared dead. The horse and cattle seemed skittish, tossing their heads as the whites of their eyes showed. One large bull took off from the mob, racing into the undergrowth with a bellow. As I was the closest to it, I was the one who had to take off after it. I moved warily, not scared of the predator who seemed to be stalking us, 
but of the bull itself. They were dangerous when cornered after all. I wasn't the only one after the bull. I soon learned as a dingo raced free from the undergrowth and bowed into the bovine. i never seen a pack of feral dogs take down a bull in the prime of its life, but here was a single canid doing so without any trouble. It was obviously a dingo. No dog could ever come close to having the same presence as the rust-coloured wild dog that was native to Australia. It was massive though, more than twice the size of a normal dingo. And its eyes, it looked up when the bull fell limp. Eyes the red of the desert sand and burning with the strength of a flame. Its teeth were bloodied as it bared them at me, stalking forward with its tail raised. I was frozen, staring at the monstrous dingo in shock. Thankfully, my horse was less so, and with a panicked whinny, my mount turned and galloped as if demons were at its heels. I could hear the dingo snarling behind me, but didn't glance back until I was free from the scrub, at the risk of outpacing the men I'd worked with. The scrub was still, as dead as a grave. Whatever that thing was, had given up the chase. I never spoke of what happened that day, no matter how many questions people plied me with. I also refused to look at the rock art on our property, the ochre pigments worn with age. The yellow has faded, but the shape was still distinguishable. It appeared that it had been wrong of me to ignore the native tales. The rocks proved that with an age-old painting of a massive dingo with ruby eyes. This story was submitted by one of my subscribers, PG. When I was 16, my friend invited a group of six of us, seven in total, including him, back to his place for his birthday. He lived in a small Tasmanian town where the beach pretty much meets the open farmland and bush. Being 16 and wanting to celebrate his birthday in style, we decided that we needed some alcohol and would jump over his back fence to go bushwalking for the night. So we loaded up our backpacks and off we went, just as the sun was going down. My friend's birthday is in May, so this was about 7pm. For the first few hours, it was great. It was one of those nights where the moon and stars were shining brightly, illuminating our path, and we were all laughing and telling stories as we consumed more and more drinks. However, our laughing and conversation died off as we heard loud noises off somewhere in the bush. Immediately recognising that the noise was human, but wondering what on earth anyone else was doing out here at this time of the night, we decided to check out what it was. When we got to the last line of trees before a massive area of grassland, followed by the beach, we immediately saw who was making the noise. About 50 to 100 metres in front of us was a group of 20 to 30 hooded figures standing around a large bonfire. One by one, lighting an individual fire torch and repeating the same chant as one of them came forward to light their torch and then chanting again when their torch was lit. Being curious but feeling like we shouldn't be there, we all laid down on the ground so we could watch without being seen. Originally, when I saw them, I thought they were Franciscan monks doing some sort of religious ritual. I even whispered that to my friends, which initially calmed us all down. However, after watching them continue this firelighting ritual and chant about it became clear that they were not Franciscan monks. I was raised Catholic and went to a Catholic school, so I knew a bit about them. Suddenly, I was filled with dread and wanted to get out of there. I was no longer interested in who these people were. I just wanted to leave. But my friends were keen to stay, and I didn't want to walk through the bush by myself. After all these hooded figures had their fire torches lit, they began a different chant, encircling the fire. When the chant ended, and they stopped moving, a few of them had dropped to their knees, and let out the most high-pitched, blood-curdling scream. It didn't sound human. It sounded like a pig stuck in a barbed wire fence. One of my friends gasped, quietly making far less noise than I had made when I suggested they were Franciscan monks. Yet somehow, this gasp, they had heard. In unison, they all turned their heads to look at us before a group of them started running at us. Immediately, we all got up and ran away as fast as we could back into the bush. In the terror of escaping, we all got separated from each other. When I realised that I was alone, I squatted down and looked back in the direction I had just been running from, hoping I could see any of my friends. I couldn't. All I could see were individual fires held by these hooded figures, individually searching the bush for us. I quickly turned around and started running back again to my friend's place, just having to hope that all my friends had made the same decision I had and weren't found. When I got back to my friend's place at around 2am, I was relieved to see the garage light on and two of my friends were already in there. For the next few hours, we sat in there in silence, just waiting for the rest of our friends to get back and drinking the remaining drinks we had in our backpacks. 
Hardly a word was said. We were all too terrified to speak. At around 5 a.m., the last two, who had managed to find each other on the way back, walked into the garage. For the first time in hours, we began to talk to each other, again discussing how we had all made our way back, and all being certain that at no stage we were spotted or followed. After we all breathed a sigh of relief, we decided that we should now head inside to the house and get some sleep. We headed through the sliding glass door to where the lounge room was with all our sleeping equipment and laid down. I don't think any of us slept. We just laid there, eyes wide open, trying to process what had happened. By 7am, the sun had risen, and we all got up realizing that sleep wasn't going to happen. Despite that, I think we all felt a weight lift off our shoulders. We made it to the morning. We were safe now. But the morning had one final twist in store for us. As we walked outside, we saw footprints on the wet morning grass, leading directly from the fence we had jumped over to start the previous night's adventure, and leading to the glass sliding door. None of us had jumped over that fence on our way back. Had these people managed to follow us from an incredible distance or track us across the bush and paddocks? Had they walked up to the glass door and watched us lying there trying to sleep? How had none of us seen anyone standing there if they had? None of us had any answers. With our fear immediately restored to the previous night's level, we tentatively walked over to the fence and peeked over to see if anything was there. Until the day I die... I won't forget the horrifying image that greeted us as we looked over the fence. On a branch of tree just over the fence were the bodies of seven dead possums. Possibly for one of each of us. They were hanging by their necks, all with their stomachs cut open so they could bleed out into the seven pentagrams that lay beneath each of their bodies. We ran back inside. My friend told his mum everything that happened the night before. She called the police and they came around to get our story but they didn't believe us. They asked for our details, took the possum bodies down, and told us they would be in contact if they needed anything else. But none of us heard from them. Over the next few years, my friend had a lot more parties at his place, leaving all of us with great memories that we would often reminisce and laugh about. However, we never spoke of this night to each other ever again. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this episode and the series as a whole. I know that these videos don't follow my traditional format and I appreciate all the awesome comments you guys have left on them. Next month we'll begin a new series on events based around a certain town in Victoria, so stay tuned for that. If you would like a shout out in upcoming videos, then leave a comment starting with Shadow Shoutout. And if you enjoyed this video, then please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to see more content like this. And don't forget to hit that notifications bell to keep up to date with the latest videos. And together, we can explore the strange, the terrifying, the unknown, the shadow matter.